What's up, guys? We are live. We got Yaron Brooks joining us. Did I did I pronounce your name correctly? Or did I butcher that? Uh, Yaron Brook, but uh, it was Yaron close enough. Brook. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, all right, so this is a uh, debate that you guys requested uh, quite a lot, so I'm glad we can make it happen. Uh, honestly, I am not too sure if there's a lot that we're going to debate about. It might be more of a discussion because as I was doing research on you uh, last night, I came to the conclusion that we agree on like 95% of the things. So it might be debate debating like the small details well let's start off with a little background intro for anyone who's not familiar with who you are just a little uh, about you sure i mean uh, i uh, i was for many years the uh, ceo of the ayn rand institute uh, from kind of 2000 till 2017 i am now chairman of the board of the institute i have my own youtube uh, show the iran book show i traveled around the world speaking i just got back from a three-week trip through europe uh, giving talks, um, and, uh, you know, in a previous life, I'd been anywhere from uh, a civil engineer to a uh, finance professor. Uh, I was always also uh, born and raised in Israel and um, served in the Israeli military for three years. Cool. Yeah, I got some family in Israel, so uh, cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to start off with this. So most of the time when I'm doing research for a debate, um, I feel like, you know, most of the time I debate, I don't know if you're familiar with my content, but I debate like black pillars and like the stuff I'm researching is like feminism has ruined the West. So every time I do research, I feel like I get dumber. But with you, I actually felt the opposite. Like <laughs> well, I feel good. like, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I actually learned myself when researching. So I just want to acknowledge that. Like clearly you're a pretty smart and reasonable guy. Thanks. But let me, let me start with this. Like clearly like for you and Rand, uh, probably butchered that as well, has had a strong impact. Why is, why is Anne Rand so important? Like why has that influenced you so much? So it's Ein, but but in <laughs> okay. announcing that's fine. Um, look, I, I was uh, I, I was growing up in Israel, like everybody, pretty much growing up in Israel when I when I was growing up, 60s, 70s. I was a real socialist. I was a collectivist. I you know I viewed myself as uh, my job in life ultimately was uh, to sacrifice for the uh, Jewish state for for my uh, collective group. Uh, I, and uh, at the age of 16, I read Atlas Shrugged and it blew my mind. It, it completely changed uh, the way I thought about the world, the way I thought about my life, the way I thought about my goals in life and, and my orientation, my focus in life. Uh, and it, it really shifted to how do I maximize this one life that I have? How do I live the best life that I can? Where should I live it? So I kind of came to the decision uh, about leaving Israel around that time. And, and just how should I live? How should I focus my mind? How should I think about the world so that I can live a great life? Uh, she really gave me a philosophy for living, a philosophy for understanding the world. And over the last, you know, it's been a long time, 40 plus years that I've, I've kind of attested her theories over and over again, tested her views, attested her explanations for the world. She's right. Uh, she gets, she got it. She and she gave us this amazingly powerful tool that sadly most people in the world are ignoring. And I think it's to all of our detriment uh, when they do ignore her. What is the crux of that philosophy? Well, the crux of the philosophy is that the purpose of life is uh, to live the best life that you can, to, to, to be successful in living and to pursue your happiness. How do you do that? Uh, you do it by pursuing what is uniquely human, and that is our capacity to reason. Our capacity to reason, to be rational, is our basic means of survival. So uh, using rationality, using reason, and she has a whole morality of self-interest, a whole egoistic morality of what is involved, what are the principles, what are the virtues and values one should pursue if one's going to make the most of one's life and ultimately attain happiness. Uh, to do that, you, you know, first of all, you have to, again, be rational, which means oriented towards reality. Facts are facts. Uh, emotions don't create the world. Emotions don't explain the world. You have to use reason for that. Uh, the, the world is not um, it, created by any consciousness. It is what it is, and, and you need to accept it, understand it, and then shape it. And then uh, the only political system in which human beings can use their mind to pursue their values uh, in pursuit of their happiness is a system of capitalism. It's a system where the government is limited 
to uh, the the uh, protection of individual rights, to the, your protection from fraud and murderers and criminals and uh, and foreign invaders. But other than that, the government should leave you alone and and let individuals pursue their values again using their reason, their mind. Um, free of, of coercion, free of intervention, free of authority. So, yep. That's pretty interesting because I've never read Anne Rand. I've obviously heard of her, but I've never read any of her work. But these are all the same conclusions that I have as well. So I've just, I think I've just naturally come to all those same conclusions. So was that like, like you said it changed your life. What, what were your like, uh, what was your thoughts before that? Like how, because these are all things that I think are fairly like, you know, common sense, no? That, like, you know, you well, should... there's a sense in which they're common sense, but nobody accepts them, right? The, the, the standard moral code in the world today is that to be good, to be a good human being, you have to sacrifice. You have to give to others. The whole orientation of morality in the world in which we live is how we deal with other people. And, and generally, placing their interest above our own interest is the good, is to be moral is to be altruistic. It's to be, place the well-being of other people above your own well-being. Oh. Um, and I basically bought into that when I was, look, I was young, right? I was, uh, oh. I was 16. But I basically bought into that. I was a collectivist. I, I believe that the, you know, the, the, you as an individual should be willing to sacrifice for the state, for the community, for the collective, for the group. In, in my case, it was kind of Jewish nationalism uh, as, as expressed in the state of Israel. Um, so, and I was a socialist. I, I believe that uh, the role of government was to make us all equal and to redistribute mm. wealth and all of that. So I was the exact opposite of everything she uh, she believed in. And and look, I think there are a lot of people who think uh, you should live for yourself, but usually they emphasize emotions and will, like a Nietzschean view, where it's willpower, it's whatever you feel like. I think she's the only thinker in history to really connect the idea of living for yourself, living the best life that you can. Mm with the exercise of the faculty of reason, with being rational and identifying that as the crux, that is the means by which we live a good life. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Wouldn't you say, though, that in some situations, collectivism is naturally, uh, is, uh, is essential? Like, for example, a good one would be military service. Like, for example, let's just take Ukraine, right? Like, it's not in the best interest of each individual Ukrainian to go out there and fight the Russians because, you know, there's a high likelihood they will die. But, you know, if they don't do it, their state will collapse. So that's like a situation, right, in my mind, where there's like, okay, collectivism has a purpose because, if you know, if everyone is thinking, okay, what do I, what, how can I do what's best for myself? Well, then no one's going to fight the Russians. So what's kind of your take on that? So collectivism is never good. There's never a situation where some collective good is above your own and take your reasoning. It, it, you know, if I die, what does collectivism help me, right? It, it, so that Ukrainian can survive as an abstraction, as a Ukraine. W you know, why do I care? Well, I care not because of collectivism, not because the collective is more important than me. I care because, you know, if you ask, if you ask the Ukrainians right now why they're fighting, and people have done this, so you can you can see interviews, mm -hmm. and they say I'm fighting for my land, my home, mm -hmm. my family, my freedom. Right. Mm -hmm. All of those are a self-interested pursuit. Right. It's their property. How dare you take my property? If you if you come at my home and, you know, I'm going to defend it. Mm -hmm. And and there's no difference if I'm defending it against the Russians. I'm defending it against a mug, you know, just somebody breaking into the house. It's my family. You're going to not going to hurt my family. You're not going to kill my kids and my wife. I'm going to fight you if you're going to try to do that. So that's mm -hmm. a self-interested motivation. Mm -hmm. I don't want you hurting the things that are important to me. And yes, to some extent. A country, if it's a free country, is a value to you. But that was an all self-interested pursuit. So you said that's not in their self-interest, but it very much is in their self-interest. If you understand self-interest, it's not just momentary pleasure. It's not just what I feel like doing today or what gets me off today. If you understand self-interest is the everything that's entailed in living the best life that I can live. I can't live the best life that I can live if I'm a slave. I can't live the best life if I can live under the boot of Putin. I can't live the best life that I can live if my kids and my family are murdered. I can't live the best life that I can live if I'm a refugee. I can't live the best life that I can live if I just give up in the face of somebody trying to hurt mm -hmm. me. I need to fight for myself. That's part of what it means to be a man, to be a human being. Uh, it's part of what it means to have self-interest and self-esteem and, mm -hmm. and value your own life.
Mm, yeah, I see your point. Just to kind of play devil's advocate on that, though. Sure. Um, you, like, for example, let's say take your average Ukrainian citizen. Like for them, you know, they, there's a lot of immigration options that are open. They can go to Poland. Uh, they can go to a whole bunch of EU countries. They're taking them. So if we're just taking a look at their survival or their family's interest, it's probably a lot more logical for them to just run away to Poland. Because, again, like their family, you know, if they do that, their family is 100 percent guaranteed safe. If they stay in Ukraine, you know, they are putting their family at risk. Like, you know, Russians are not above, you know, shooting random people. Sure. So uh, so like wouldn't if we're just talking about a logically, purely logical self-interest, wouldn't it make more sense for them to uh, immigrate to Poland or something like that? Look, if they hate Ukraine and they they long term plan is not to be in Ukraine, then maybe. But but if somebody attacks you. Um, and, and, and places your, your family and yourself a threat. And let's say you live in your neighborhood and there's some, mm-hmm. somebody that's constantly harassing you and, and that, wants to, that wants to take your house. You know, you could just leave and, and move to another neighborhood, take the loss, uh, you know, so, 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 so you give up the house and just hand him the keys and walk away and, and it's his. If you stay, you might have to get into a fight with him and he might hurt your family and so on. But that's, that's super cowardly. Mm-hmm. And it's not rational. You know, it's, it's what about the next house? What, when you give into evil, um, you, are, you are giving in, uh, you, you're basically giving up your own life. You're giving up your own independence. This is my life. This is my home. This is my land. How dare you threaten me? I'm not just going to walk away from that without a fight. And I think that's true in your home uh, vis-a-vis crooks. Now, hopefully you have the police to help you with that one. Uh, but it's also true uh, of, uh, of of somebody invading your home. Uh, yeah, we could all be cowardly and run, but we know that the consequence of that ultimately are no self-esteem, no self-confidence, and uh, and uh, and the fact that evil chases you, right? If, if Ukraine folds, um, Putin will just chase the next target. Sure. But when you say, though, in the statement... Um you uh, evil chases you then that implies an element of collectivism because it's like uh you know you're basically you know fighting to stop evil which is a collective goal right because the, the assumption is put in is evil which you know i think we can all semi agree with uh right he's you know if we don't stop him if ukraine doesn't stop him then he's going to keep going and spread that evil to other people so look so, so working with other people is not collectivism collectivism is the placing of other people above your own well-being Okay. I think I your well-being is tied in to the idea of fighting for your values, mm-hmm. fighting the bad guys who threaten you. Now, if it's a bad guy, like I'm not volunteering to go fight in Ukraine. Not going to do it. Not going <laughs> to fight. I, neither am I. I'm not going <laughs> to sacrifice, right? You're yeah. not going to sacrifice. Well. But if somebody's attacking your house, I, you know, some people are going to run away. But I think I think that the people who value their life, the people who are most egoistic in a sense, who value their property, who believe in themselves, are actually going to put up a fight when somebody attacks you. And look at the founding fathers uh, fought of, of America, fought, uh, you know, the, the the British, the greatest military force at the time. They thought they were going to die. They didn't think they'd win. And yet they fought it. Why did they fight it? Because they wanted to live as free men. They, mm-hmm. they wanted to live under freedom. And, and they were willing to risk everything in order to attain freedom. And that was an incredibly self-interested, logically self-interested thing to do. Because in logic, your ability to live a good life under freedom is so much greater than your ability, if there is any, to live a good life as a, as a slave or a serf or under the boots of a dictator. So you want to fight and you want to, uh, and this is why I think soldiers rationally uh, you know, fight for their country, not so much because the country is more important than them, but because Part of what it means to be an individual is to fight for your own freedom, for your own liberty, and to care about your own family, your own property, uh, and and the people that you love and care for. Okay, I see, I see your point. So let, let me uh, ask you this. So I think uh, you know this is a question that um, and and a, <laughs> and Rand proponents. I am uh, with, with mine. Yeah, you yeah. usually get, but basically, it's uh, how this ties into hyper capitalism. So. If you are a successful business person, right, it's probably not in your best interest uh, 
it, it's it's not in your personal best interest to, for example, uh, you know, uh, recycle, right, or to responsibly dispose waste. It's in your best interest to just dump it, right? Uh, but you don't do that because you know society has rules against that, and you could fuck things up for other people if you dump your waste in the river and whatnot. So, how does that tie into there? Like, how do you be like? Can you be you know an Ayn Rand proponent? And be like, you know, a responsible business person uh, who doesn't always think about themselves, but actually cares about, you know, the environment and shit. Well, again, I don't think the two are any contradiction. I think they do think about themselves, but they care about the environment, at least to some extent. Right. So they live in the environment. So you dump your shit and you pollute everywhere. You breathe it. Your family breathes it. Your friends breathe it. The community which you live breathes it. That's not good for you. Again, we we. We need to get away from the perception of self-interest to some narrow, emotionless, short-term, you know, you don't love anybody, you don't care about anybody, because that's not self-interest. You want to love, you want to care, you want to have friends, you want to you want to be part of something. But even, even beyond that, uh, you know, we all agree that I can't bring a, a dump truck and dump all my garbage in my in your backyard, right? And and the reason is not because um, I care about you. Right. The reason I can't dump my garbage in your backyard is you can sue me. Right. You, you're going to I'm violating your property rights. And and that we know that we live together. That is not acceptable. The law is in your favor. It's against me. So if I dump stuff in a river that's owned by somebody and ideally under capitalism, rivers are owned by people, then they'll sue me. They'll, you know, they'll bankrupt me. If I spew stuff into the air that's going to actually hurt people. Again, they will launch a class action lawsuit and drive me out of business. Uh, and there is a role for government to say, look, you cannot do harmful things to other people. You cannot violate their rights. You cannot make them sick. You cannot destroy their property. So the, 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 the government has a role in protecting rights. And I think pollution is, is an example of where the government has some function, some role, and uh, and where that kind of provides me with the right kind of incentives, even if I, I don't know, if I, if I, if I uh, somehow conclude that it was okay to dump the stuff in the river, um, I've got financial incentives under capitalism not to do it. Okay, I see your point. Yeah, I would argue that in the U.S., the government doesn't really do a good job of that, especially in the last ten years of preventing uh, this kind of stuff. But that's a. Uh, well, but I would say that the real problem in the United States and everywhere in the world is we don't have enough property rights. 75% of all the land west of the Mississippi is owned by the state, whether federal, uh, local, or, or state. Um, imagine if all of that was private property. Imagine if the rivers were private property. Imagine if the coastline was private property. Then you wouldn't be dumping it. You wouldn't because there'd be somebody with an interest monitoring you and making sure that you didn't uh, destroy the value of their property. So the most filthy places on the planet are public spaces. The most filthy places on the planet are places that are not owned by anybody. But once you own something, you clean it up because you care about it. It's yours. So the way to solve pollution problems in the United States is to privatize what isn't private. And a lot of what we have today is not private. So, so the worst thing for pollution is public property. Yeah, so I would actually argue with you on that um, uh, because you there's like wildlife reserves and protected national parks. You can't make it private because then that is going to get destroyed. You see this happening with Amazon, for example. Uh, there's the privatization of the Amazon jungle. And what do they do? You know, they basically cut down the trees and use it for uh, for farming of bananas or whatever, or of rice. There's actually no privatization. That's the problem with Amazon. The problem with Amazon is nobody owns it. So what happens is very poor people, and, and unfortunately in Brazil – has a lot of very pure, pre, poor people because it doesn't have capitalism. They go in, they clear cut a forest, and they and they use it for agriculture. And then they move on, right, because they don't own the land. There's no property rights. They don't own the land. They can't cultivate it over and over again. They move on, clear cut another forest. The problem with Amazon, imagine if it was privately owned, people would have an incentive to use it effectively. And indeed, environmentalist groups could buy huge chunks of the Amazon and protect it. Right. Mm -hmm. Under property right laws. Right now, there's no way to protect that law. The way in which um, the way in which the best way to protect land is to put it into the hands of private people. I mean, in Africa, the way they're protecting things like elephants and um, and lions is to privatize it. 
is to actually have private ownership over lands in which the elephants and which the lions and say these elephants are yours. And now I can sell the right to photograph them. I can even sell the right to kill them. But then I monitor how many are killed and make sure that the hood is replenished and that there's a constant because I have a financial incentive to do it. So it turns out that privatization is actually the best way to preserve land, forests, animals that one could imagine. Well, what's to stop once you privatize like a big piece of land where there's, <clears throat> let's just say, uh, whatever, certain type of wildlife that's not found anywhere. What's to stop that person who bought the land from chopping down all the trees and building into land and developing into condos? Because that's much more financially you know, beneficial for them. Right? That's a lot more. There's a lot more money in, you know, condos and, you know, having tourism than it is protecting, you know, elephants or whatever. So what's to stop them from doing that? Well, partially, I mean, if you build condos, the tourists won't come. Right. So the tourists are coming to see wildlife and you're building condos. So it doesn't work quite that well. But nothing. Right. In a sense, nothing. And nothing should stop them. Right. So, uh, you know, species have gone out of ex existence uh, since the beginning of time. Uh, you know, human beings are part of nature, part of what we do, part of our activities, probably uh, forces some species to go out of existence. So what? Right. So they, so if you value a particular species, if you value a particular forest, if you value a particular place, they get your friends together and buy it up and 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 don't allow any development of it. But uh, by what right do you tell me who well, I own this property and you're not willing to buy it from me? I own it now. Uh, what I can and cannot do with it, right? And and which animals and who gets to decide? These are all very, uh, uh, you know, ways in which we try to control individual people's lives. So I say, you know, you love them, you love spotted owls, buy a forest in Oregon and 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 help protect spotted owls, but don't interfere in how I use my property. The thing is, is that sounds nice in theory, uh, you know, just uh, you, if you really care about this, buy it up. But in practice, it almost never works that way because the amount of money that environmental groups or animal rights groups have is jokeable to the amount of money that development groups have. So in reality, you know, we're not going to get that much land because we don't have a fraction of the money they have. I'm not, not like not, not exactly right. Environmentalist group, if you look at the environmentalist group, they have tr billions and billions of dollars. I mean, they have a lot of money. And more than that, if, if they didn't spend it on trying to control me and trying to control and lobbying Congress and trying to pass laws and trying to control everything, they'd probably have even more. If they targeted uh, this, if, if there was an appeal, look, we want to buy X piece of land because there's a, some animal that, 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 you know, help us, uh, I think they'd have a lot more money. But look, I don't think the standard is the environment. The standard is human life. And the fact that the environmentalist groups maybe can't raise as much money as development can, if that's true, is, is a sign that we value as human beings development more than we do uh, the, the environmentalist policies. So oh, we definitely do. Yeah. So, so, so good. So, so let's develop, right? So why, if you're a minority view that think that we should protect X, Y, Z, uh, why should you impose your will on the majority view that doesn't want to protect X, Y, Z, but wants to live a better life? So, you know, again, the nice thing about a marketplace, the nice thing about capitalism is that, you know, we get to see what people's real preferences are. If you really care about something, you get to put your money into that thing. And if you don't care about it, you don't get to put money into it. And so the environmentalist groups will put will buy as much land as they can, given how valuable that is to the people involved. Instead, they play politics. Um, and that's exactly what I think is damaging. It's damaging when you start using a gun in society, when you start imposing your values on other people. And then if they do it, then business does it, and other people do it. And now we get constant warfare in the political realm of me trying to impose myself on you and you trying to impose myself on me. No, let's just make this voluntary. Environmentalist groups buy whatever land they want. I develop whatever land I want and, you know, let the outcome be what it is. Yeah, so um, I think every group that's is guilty of playing politics. Yeah, I think every group is guilty of playing politics. It's not just of course, that's why that's why we should get rid of politics in our economic life, so that they don't play politics with our lives. So, so let me kind of be a politics. I want politics to be there just to protect me and nothing else. Right. So the the reason why, uh, and I'm not a big fan of imposing my will on other people. Uh, but, you know, in some cases we realize that it's important, for example, preventing murder and theft. So as a society, we realize that sometimes it is important.
for us to impose our will. Like, for example, child you know, predators don't think there's anything wrong with what we're doing. But we as society, we've decided, no, we're not going to allow old men to bang little kids. So, right. So we do impose our will, you know, and that's, you know, a standard in certain things. But I think I do think that environment and protection of land has to be one of them. Uh, because human beings are naturally very selfish and short-sighted, and it's going to be really sad when our grandchildren don't have any water or any, you know, nature that they can go in because we, our generation, was selfish and destroyed it all. So I think there are some reasons where we have to we have to protect certain things. And I would argue that just like we protect little kids from pedophiles, we have to protect the environment and you know animals from you know who are going to be dead. Uh, from destroying us simply because if we want to look at it purely from a utilitarian perspective is because it's going to affect our grandkids ability to, you know, breathe clean air and live. Like, for example, in China, the average lifespan in certain cities is like 35 years because they destroyed the air uh, by being hyper capitalist. Like that's a big issue in China is they're super hyper capitalist and yeah. they just don't care about each other at all. Like they just completely, you know, just destroy shit for the sake of short term profit. So it'll be my yeah. counter argument to that. So, so first, um, there's a big difference between uh, preventing pedophiles from uh, abusing kids and protecting the environment. Uh, and, and the difference is force. Uh, it is completely appropriate to stop people from using coercion, using force, uh, from, from abusing other people uh, physically. And, and uh, that's the whole role of government. Government is an institution of force. It's a monopoly over the use of force. And we wanted to use that force in stopping people from hurting one another, physically hurting one another. So uh, that's the one area in which government has uh, the authority to act, and that is to prevent crimes, to prevent physical crimes, to prevent thieves, uh, violating people's property rights and, and violating people's person, violating, you know, uh, obviously child molesting, murder, uh, and, and uh, assault and things like that. Yeah, Aaron, just got a quick comment. comment. Government is force, right? Government is a gun. That, so it's a gun should only be used in self-defense, no other purpose. Yeah, I just got to comment on that. It's, we don't only use it to uh, prevent uh, things that involve force. For example, intellectual property theft. There's no, I'm not using any force when I steal your intellectual property. Uh, you know, well, you might like fraud. Fraud is, uh, fraud is a form of force. Th uh, stealing intellectual property is, is a form of force. It is taking something that belongs to me without me knowing it. You haven't pulled a gun explicitly because let's say you sneak into my house and take my stuff. That counts as force. The same thing as intellectual property. The same thing as, as fraud. What, what if I just dump my waste on your lawn? Would that be force? Yes, absolutely. Because you're violating my property rights. Absolutely. And you're using, you're doing something physical to violate my property rights. So uh, 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 stealing my stuff, destroying my stuff, which is dumping your, your waste in my backyard is for okay what, what if i dump my waste in the ocean no one really owns the ocean well my, my, my solution ocean? to that is 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 let's get people owning the ocean i think it'd be cleaner if people owned it so i would like to, to apply the principles of property right how to do that is tricky maybe but to apply the principles of property right to rivers and lakes and uh and the ocean at least the the shoreline of the ocean so that you can't just dump your stuff in somebody else's property it, you know, so so that's a way of protecting it. But let me let me um, let me get to this idea. Of people are short-sighted. First of all, I don't think people are short-sighted. I think it's it's amazing how long-sighted human beings are. Uh, I mean, look at where we are today. Over the last two hundred fifty years, life expectancy has well over doubled. Over the last two hundred fifty years, our wealth has gone up by uh, really in terms of standard of living by thousands of times. Sure, our wealth has gone well, up. That's technology. Times. We're very innovative. Yeah. None of that could have happened without people thinking long term. People think long every uh, long term every day. And now, Some people do, should, yeah. now, should I think long term in terms of my grandkids? I, I think that would be bizarre. I don't know what my grandkids will value. I don't know what my grandkids will want. I don't know what will be available on a planet that my grandkids live in. For example, uh, by every measure, the number of people in the world when my grandkids are adult is going to be actually smaller than it is today. The, the human population is going to peak at around 9 billion and start shrinking after that. So actually- they what, might... what research is that based on? Because I've looked at that and it's, 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 it is going to slow down its rate of growth, but it's only going to keep growing. No, it's going billion, to go down. Billion. In, in the West, in the West, we're already shrinking. Every, every single Western country, with the exception of Israel, uh, every developed country with the exception of Israel is no, shrinking. No, I mean, to total world population. like Total that. world population, assuming. So China is going to shrink dramatically 
very, very soon. It's it's going to start declining. Um, India is going to is still growing for a while and then start shrinking. This is the fact. Every population that reads that reaches a middle class income starts plateauing or shrinking. So there's no country in the world that has a, a, a significant middle class that is actually growing in population, except Israel. Israel is that, that relies on the assumption that third world countries will get to that point, which they might not. Well, they, 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 the, the reason they might not is because we impose certain environmental regulations on them that prohibit them from growing. But, uh, but absolutely, they will. There's absolutely no reason a third world country can't reach the scale uh, and, and the growth and the wealth that the rest of the world has. Let me say something about China, because I, I mean, just, I think you're just wrong on China. Um, life expectancy in China is not 35. It was 35. In third cities. No, in the, inside the cities, it's not 35 at all. It's well into the 70s. I mean, I might be exaggerating. It's like 45, but it's, no, under it's not 45. It's in the 70s. I'll, I'll pull it uh, up. Yep. I, I don't know. I don't know what the source is, but it's um, uh, China is an aging population, and and part of the part of the problems China has is they're going to have to support a lot of old people uh, in the cities. Uh, pollution is bad in the cities, but that's because they haven't reached their level of wealth where they can clean it up. One of the things you have to do in order to get rich is pollute. Uh, it's just a, a, a fact of, um, of development. The way in which you develop is you use cheap forms of energy in order to develop, and those tend to be polluting. Then you get rich enough, you clean them up. Um, the most polluting period in, in, in Western history was the late 19th century when we spewed coal into the air, and yet that was a period in which uh, life expectancy almost doubled. So uh, pollution is not what's holding back life expectancy. It's it's behaviors like in the United States, like obesity and taking opioids, which no, is. I agree. I agree with you on that. I mean, there, there's there, there can be multiple factors. Okay, I found I found the source. Okay, so I heavily exaggerated. It's uh, from CNN. Air pollution cuts life expectancy by four point five point five years in China. So definitely not much. as much. Uh, to well, five and a half years than the baseline in other yeah. cities, I guess. We don't know what the baseline. Is. But first of all, about northern China. I'm I'm typically skeptical of of headlines like that. You have to dig into the data, and you discover that you know it's a CNN headline, so it's it's going to be it's going to try to catch your attention. But even if that were true, uh, what was life expectancy in that part of China before industrialization? And I would bet you. That if you look at the net increase in uh, the, the net change in life expectancy from pre-industrialization to industrialization with pollution, life expectancies increased dramatically over that period. And yes, it could be higher when they clean it up, and they will clean it up when they get rich enough to clean it up. You know, clean air is a luxury of the rich, and when countries, developing countries, get rich, they clean the air. So um, uh, it, you know, it's just a matter of time before Chinese cities have clean air if they allow themselves to become rich. I'm not sure they will because I think China has lots of other problems uh, that, 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 that might not allow them to get as rich as they can. But look, in every, in every realm, uh, the environment gets cleaner and cleaner as we become richer and richer because we're long-term thinkers and we live in the environment. And even those capitalists who supposedly don't think long-term, they live in the environment. They don't want to live in a, in a shitty environment. But it's it's so correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you believe the free market capitalism basically takes care of pretty much every problem. Is that correct or no? Except except force, except uh, except uh, you know, as you said, uh, abusing children and and stealing, and you need a set of laws to protect us from the use of force. Other than that, the market takes care of everything. Okay, how about monopolies? There are no monopolies in a free market. They never have been, and they never will be. Uh, take take the example of uh, well, Standard well, Oil. Right, which is always used as an example of a monopoly, uh, because the United States was relatively a free market at the time, and Standard Oil in 1870 said 93 percent of all the oil refining capacity in the U.S., uh, which is qualifies, I guess, as a monopoly. And yet prices went down every year, and quality went up every year. The exact opposite behavior of what you'd expect from a monopoly, because every businessman who's super successful knows that if they slack off. If they abuse the power that they have, there will be competition. Competition is just around the corner. They will take them over. Indeed, Standard Oil in the 1870s was producing kerosene, which was used for lighting. The competition around the corner was Thomas Edison, who invented the light bulb and, 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 and knocked them out. Um, by the time they were broken up because of antitrust laws, uh, Standard Oil only had 23% of the refining capacity in the U.S. Why? 
because of competitors. The markets take care of companies that are too big. Okay, uh, so yeah, so I got so a brand new monopolies. Okay, so well, on that, what, how what would you call Facebook? Uh, Facebook is something that people love to use, and they uh, they use it extensively. It's not what's, a what's your competition to what's your what's your alternative to Facebook if you want to use a if you want to use that? They're Facebook, Google, YouTube. Those are all well, I, I can are use. I can use Twitter. I can use YouTube. I can use Google. I can use all these. Are each competing with one another? They're all in generally the same space. Uh, you know, the fact that a lot of people choose to use Facebook maybe is a result of the fact that they like Facebook and that Facebook serves their needs. I don't understand it. I don't like Facebook, but but obviously billions of people do. So the fact that a company is big and successful is not a sign that it's a monopoly. And indeed, who is it abusing here? It's the price that it's charging its customers is zero, the exact opposite of how a monopoly is supposed to behave. There are there are there are huge issues with these platforms uh, because they don't have competition. Like, what's what is the competition to YouTube? Like, we're on YouTube right now, and you know we can't say too much bad things so they don't kick us off. But what is the competition to YouTube? No, I, I, I'm happy to say bad things about YouTube. Um, the competition for YouTube is is other s services that are similar like that weren't as successful, like Vimeo. Uh, but, they're, like but they're not. But they're, but they're like not even Instagram. close. That's the issue. What's that? But they're, they're not even close. That's the issue. They're so not even you... close because YouTube provides a dramatically superior service and therefore has, has done a better job. But, you know, it, it, they, what is the solution? Let's what is the solution to, to YouTube's dominance? I don't think I don't know if I have a good solution. But the issue is with all these tech companies like YouTube, Facebook is they have complete control. When, so did, YouTube, why... when did YouTube get its so, so-called complete control? By the way, Twitter is offering a, a video service. Lots of people are offering you, uh, video services. They're not as good as YouTube. Why are they not as good as YouTube? Because we, all of us, including you and me, choose to use YouTube. That well, is, we have no choice, Yaron. If we're, we're not on YouTube, no one knows who we are. We of course we do. Uh, you know, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Trump is launching a service with with uh, with with video, supposedly. Yeah, we'll see how all that works. Uh, you know, all these other things have services, but the reason we're not moving, the reason not enough of us are willing to move, a it's because YouTube does a pretty good jo job for us, and b uh, because we don't want to move. If if enough of us decided to move, we would move. But the thing is, it's not happening. They have complete dominance, and that's why they're allowed they to do complete dominance because they provide you with the service that you want. So that, so my point is, yeah, they have a dominant company, but a monopoly is somebody who supposedly extracts so-called monopolistic rents. You're getting YouTube for free. Almost everybody gets YouTube for free. What what, what rents are they extracting? What is the cost? There, there's there's big issues with a lot of these platforms. Let's take Instagram for example. I have my account deactivated. Due to uh, due to someone reporting me for uh, uh, not being whatever, not being myself. Clearly, I am Alex sure. Uh I I spent three months going through their customer service. No person you can call. No person you can email. There's no email address. No one you can talk to. Constantly over and over. Spent three months. The only way I was able to get my account back is because I was able to meet someone who works at Facebook and have them submit internally. That's the only way you can get your account back. Then you know what happens. Two yeah. weeks later, I get my account taken down for the same exact thing that yep. they already told me that I'm not. And then I have to go through the whole process again. Again, the only way I can get my account back is because I work. A lot of, for example, people, uh, you know, uh, controversial people, they get their accounts, they get shadow banned, they get accounts taken down, and there's nothing they can do because that tech company has decided that, hey, we don't want you on our platform and we're going to censor you. And there's nothing you can do as a content creator about I that. I get it. And so be it, right? That's the price you pay for living in, in a world in which you get this amazing service. You get an amazing platform and you get it for free and you get to use it. And yeah, they, they suck at certain things. And I agree, they suck. I, you know, Facebook, I have problems with Facebook all the time. They suck. But on the other hand, imagine a world with no Facebook. That is, your, the value added is obviously enormous and they suck at certain things. Let's hope they improve. And what would be really amazing is if somebody competed them away and, and did a better job at it. But the crux, uh, but the what happened? Facebook didn't exist 15 years ago. YouTube wasn't dominant 10 years ago. Um, all these platforms are brand new platforms. They they drove out of business the previous platforms. And 10, 15 years from now, I don't know if they'll exist. I don't know if they'll be the dominant platforms in the world. Maybe, maybe not. But the crux of the issue is that no other company has a fighting chance because they have such dominance. It's unbelievably not true. You know, uh, uh, for, for years and years and years, everybody thought Microsoft... Uh, was it, and then came Apple and Google that are uh, as big and, and for a while were bigger than uh, than Microsoft. Uh, there have been Yahoo. 
used to dominate the online space, used to dominate search, used to dominate news, used to dominate all these things. Along came Google, bump Yahoo off. Um, in every space, IBM used to dominate computers. Uh, and it, the, the, there was an antitrust lawsuit filed against them. And then came Apple and a bunch of other right. IBM clones and, and took away their business. So this, So the more free market we have, the more competition there is, the more these platforms will not survive unless they provide us a great service. Uh, and, uh, and if they do, we don't care. And if they, if they don't, then competition will arise. Competition always arises. Um, you know, uh, uh, what was this, what is this platform? I get stuff on them all the time. They talk what? Uh, no, there's this new, the, the platform where people just talk clubhouse, right? Clubhouse came out of nowhere. Now it's not huge yet. A uh, Substack. Substack has changed the way in which people blog completely. It's completely changed that environment. It's 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 potentially even go changing the way we consume news and and challenging uh, the media. I mean, the next innovation, the next company, the next thing that people in, in Silicon Valley constantly funding somebody trying to knock Facebook off the top of the hill. Constantly, they're facing competition. Mostly, they do a good job, so they keep they keep themselves on top for us. But they do a good job for the majority of people who consume them. Otherwise, yeah, in all, pretty much all examples you gave, there is just an example of uh, one company taking dominance over another company. Yeah. Uh, the problem, the problem with YouTube, the problem with Facebook, the problem with Instagram is that there is no competition. We don't. If you're not happy as a content creator, as a user with Facebook, there's nowhere else you can go, and they know that. That's why they don't they don't have to offer you basic decency or basic customer service because they know where you're going to go. Like if you don't like Instagram, where are you going to go? You have nowhere to go. It's yeah. not like, for example, Verizon or AT&T. They're fighting for your service. And in those situations, yes, I do agree. Capitalism does take care of a lot of the issues because Verizon knows that if they let their customer service drop, you're going to go to AT&T. What's to stop you? So they're going to it's, really it's hard. Unbelievable, it's unbelievable to me, right? 15 years ago, you couldn't make a living, right, doing what you do. There was just no, no ability to do what you do and make a living. So these platforms, because they're so dominant, because they have reached to billions of people, have provided you with a means by which to make a living that was unthinkable probably even 10 years ago, right? There was, just, there was just no way to do it. And suddenly these platforms have created a means by which we can make a living doing what we do. And instead of being, I mean, I'm incredibly grateful to YouTube and Facebook and Twitter in spite of my qualms about how they do it in spite of my complaints and i i also appreciate the incredible nature of, of of technology and markets that have given us these platforms that allow me and you to make a living and yes sometimes we have to spend three months on fixing something but it's something that without these platforms never would have existed and we wouldn't be in this profession to begin with. Yaron, you can be grateful and see something as an issue. I, I see it as an issue. I see the customer service as an issue. And I think if they don't fix it, a competitor will arise and will take them out. I, I found it interesting that just yesterday, I think Elon Musk, uh, it was announced that Elon Musk has taken a 10% stake, a 9 point something percent stake in Twitter, right? So here's somebody saying, okay, instead of buying, instead of creating a competitor to Twitter, I maybe can buy Twitter and fix it from the inside. Um, capitalism has a variety of different ways to fix real problems that exist out there when we allow it to function. And look, we don't have pure free markets today. For example, Elon Musk couldn't buy 50% of Twitter and just walk no, into we never did. CEO. He could have. In the past, he could have. Uh, he can't just, today can't because of disclosure laws and SEC and, and a million other regulations. He can't just take over the company and kick out the CEO. He has to do it slowly and do it and, and give them enough time to defend themselves. But he was announced he's joining the board today. So maybe Twitter will change from the inside. We'll see. This is the beauty of capitalism. How to predict how change will come. But if they're not doing the job that we want them to do, they will get replaced. Yeah, I guess where you and I differ is I have serious doubts about whether capitalism can take care of every single one of these problems, especially where that situation arises where what I perceive to be a monopoly. And I think you'd be hard pressed to argue that Facebook and these tech companies are a monopoly because, again, there's no. Yeah, there are. What does monopoly mean? What does monopoly mean? They completely dominate the vast majority of that space. And, and does it matter whether anybody is suffering as a consequence if there's a cost to it or not? 
it does matter, and there is a cost. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying these companies don't. There's do no cost to, to to the billions of people who use it. There's a cost to us just creators once in a while in a certain in. in, in there are, there's a lot of free speech issues, Yaron. There's a lot of issues that these companies. I will agree with you. People don't. They don't like. I agree that there are issues. I'm not they're saying actually basically no deciding issues. our policies. A lot of if ways. the issues were so big that they upset hundreds of millions of people then another platform would arise. Obviously, most people don't care, and maybe that's the real issue, not the issue with Facebook. It's the fact that most people don't care about the, these issues about speech and others. Well, that's, a, that's an issue in of itself, but I think you know uh, the founding fathers of America kind of acknowledged this. They said, we don't want the government run by the uh, ignorance of the masses because they realized the average person was pretty dumb and uninformed. Absolutely. Uh, so but the problem with, 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 uh, with saying that uh, Facebook is a solution, is a monopoly, is what is the solution? The solution has to be the government coming in and breaking it up. Well, and then, you're, then you're putting power into the hands of the truly ignorant. But Yarn, you can separate okay. the problem from the solution. We can agree on the problem and disagree on the solution. Yeah, I, I, so, I agree there's a problem. I agree there are problems out there. And I believe strongly that the only way to solve that problem is through competition. And the only way to get competition is to get the government out of the way to allow uh, more companies, more capital creation, and uh, in more ability of people to start new companies and and compete with these guys. But take so away any any favors the government gives any of these guys, take them away. I, I agree with you on that. I, I agree with you on that. But the problem is, is that when you have a company that's so dominant, they are going to influence politics. That almost always happens. They well, that's why you have to make politicians impotent. If you make politicians impotent in, in terms of economic policy, then then uh, companies don't have any incentive to. How do you do that in politics? You have a separation of state from economics in the Constitution. The state is not allowed to intervene in the economy. So basically, like, what no regulations, say? no taxes. Uh, so no, you know, maybe maybe no a taxes? Simple, maybe a simple flat, you know, tax, no exemptions, no loopholes, no anything. So just just something really simple that everybody pays the same amount on. So eliminate every single incentive possible for businesses to lobby government by taking away the power of government over companies. But then you have to completely strip the government down to nothing. Yeah, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. Police, military, and a judiciary, that would be fantastic. All of our lives would be dramatically improved and we'd be a lot richer than we are today. And to start competitors to Facebook, we'd all have enough money to do that. Mm, I, I have my doubts about that. I mean, in order for this is the kind of the uh, catch 22 issue that you have is in order to protect some of these rights that, you know, are important to me and you, you do. The government needs to have a little bit of teeth. Now, look, I'm not a proponent. Yeah, I need some military a police and a judiciary yeah. but that. But you could shrink the government today by over 80 percent. And, and, and have those as robust as they are today. No, I agree with you. You can, you can shrink government. Yeah. Of the government is, you know, in the 19th century, the government had a pretty good military, pretty good police, judiciary, and it only spent, it spent less than 5% of GDP total, state, local, and federal. Today, it spends over 40%. So you can go 40% to 5%. That's a big, that's a lot of, putting a lot of money back in our pockets, back in the private economy. To, to use in productive endeavors and make the, our standard of living dramatically higher. Yeah, so I, just to be clear, I'm not a proponent of big government. I do agree with you that the government can be stripped down. I don't think by 80%, but by a decent amount. Yes. But then what do you do about, okay, what do you do about, you know, uh, the money, uh, basic, basically like the issue with capitalism that you get quite often is that, uh, well, actually, it's more of an issue of technology is a lot of these jobs are going to be automated away. So you have basically... The average, you know, a huge discrepancy between the guys at the top point and one percent, and basically everyone else, uh, you know, like between Jeff Bezos and average person, and without the government coming in and uh, to some extent redistributing those economics through various programs, like for example, you know, Andrew Yang has the thousand dollar grant. Like, how do you like? How does that work with the average person doesn't even have a job because it's been automated away without government? No time in history, no time in history, you can't find one example in which. Uh, total jobs decreased uh, under a semi-free economy. That is, automation always creates more jobs than it, it eliminates, always. It's always been the case. I mean, the same argument was made when the weaving uh, machines were brought in. What are the weavers going to do? Every, every single time, I remember in the 1980s, computers are going to take all our jobs away. But every single time, automation creates more jobs. We've got 8 billion people on planet Earth today actually working uh, in jobs, and most of those jobs didn't exist 50 years ago, certainly didn't exist 200 years ago. So automation 
is a net increase in jobs. It's a net increase in quality of life, a net increase in standard of living, net increase in wages. Again, at every single turning point, automation has increased the standard of living and wages of the average person. There's never been a time where the average person's income has gone down because of automation. Never. Yeah, I mean, the argument I would make is we've never had a period in time like our time. Uh, like, like for example, okay. Every time they say that. They always say that, right? And it's exactly our time, right? I mean, the fact is that, that wages are going up, standard of living going up, and life becomes easier and easier and longer and longer because of the technologies we develop. Because These guys become billionaires by making our lives easier and by making it easier for us to live good lives. So quality and standard of living are going up dramatically because these guys make billions. I don't care how much money Jeff Bezos makes on the country. The more he makes, the more he's made my life better in one way or another. Uh, There's no okay. way to make money in a free market without making the lives of other people better. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Like, Just to be clear, I'm not anti-capitalistic, but I sure. think that you are more – Pure capitalism, where I'm more proponent of mixed capitalism. Okay, let's just let's just take a historical example. Like, let's just take a look at other countries. Can you like find one example of a country that has pure capitalism that is doing better? Because all the countries I know that anyone wants to live in, like Europe, Scandinavia, America, Canada, they're all countries that have mixed systems where there's capitalism, but there's also socialism coming in and protecting people's rights, absolutely, and, and having healthcare and whatnot. So, is there any examples of countries that have pure capitalism? Where no, I mean. The closest we've ever come was the 19th century, uh, second half of the 19th century in the United States. Notice that during that period, millions and millions and millions and millions of people came from all over the world here, even though there was no safety net, no nothing, no benefits, tiny little government, and, and as pure of capitalism as we've ever gotten in history. Hong Kong is another example before the Chinese took it over recently. Hong Kong was an island where it, almost no safety net, no health insurance, no uh, free health care, no government benefits, no controls, just as close to capitalism as we've come again. And millions of people came there. It, it used to be a fishing village and it's seven and a half million people there. So in every example where we experiment with it, it's been an enormous success and then we dump it anyway. Yes, Europe and the United States and Canada are all mixed economies. And I think that is to our detriment. I, you know, Let me give you a, a, a simple example. If you um, if the economy, a mixed economy grows significantly slower than a pure capitalist economy. I if, I, if our economy grows at 2% a year for the next 40 years, then your wages will, I don't know, uh, uh, more than double, right? If, if, if they grow with the growth of the economy. And this is, let's assume, real terms, so inflation adjusted, right? Um, but if the economy goes at 5% a year for the next 40 years, then your wages will 8x, the difference between doubling and 8x is huge. Capitalism has the potential to eradicate any form of poverty, to make every poor But person that poor. assumes trickle-down economics. But trickle-down economics always works. It always works. It's not trickle-down. It's a flood-down. It's like a waterfall. Uh, the fact is that the greatest beneficiaries of capitalism are the poor. They've always have been. Okay, let's, 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 let's take the late uh, late 19th century that you were describing yeah. or whatever, early 18th century. For the average person, life was total shit. People were working in factories really? 16, hour, 16 really? hours a day, man. There well, was what were they doing before that? So they're, life they're working on the farm. So 50 years before that, they were working on the farm, dying at the age of 35, uh, their kids, uh, half of them were dying before the age of 10. Uh, most of their women died at childbirth. And they worked from sunrise. Yeah, and I'm not denying that, that. Let's finish. Let's finish. Sunrise to sunset. By the end of the 19th century, they were working in factories, not 16-hour days, but shorter than that. They were making a lot more money than they did on the farm. They now had running water and electricity. Um, and the kids were alive. They were so much alive that they were now sending them to school for the first time in all of human history. So the 19th century, the late 19th century is the greatest era for the development, for the advancement of poor people ever in all of human history. It is, you know, so, uh, yeah, I'll take, I'll take the economic growth of the late 19th century over any other period in all of human history any time. Now, the, the, the labor conditions, you can't go from poor farmers and have nothing to where we are today working eight hour days maybe and having the kind of lifestyle that we have without a period in which we had to work hard in the factories. That's just the evolution. That's why every developing country goes through the same process. But the fact is that that period saw 
the highest increases among the poor of standard of living that they've ever seen in all of history. Yarn, I'm not denying that technological innovation improves quality of life, but the only reason we were able to go to what we have now, eight hours days, is because the government came in and said, hey, we're not, we're going to not allow you to work people 16 hours a day. We're not going to allow child labor. We're not going to allow you to- dump Absolutely the not true. Statistically not true. Now, I know Wikipedia will say something different, but it's just not true. The How's fact that is true? that if you actually go in and, and, and look at the laws, the laws always passed after the phenomena is already in place. That is- uh, child labor was already in dramatic decline before any law was passed to uh, get rid of child labor. Uh, the work hours were already shrinking well before the government or union stepped in to start shrinking uh, the, working, uh, the working hour. Five-day weeks uh, were already being imposed in some places by, uh, by uh, factory owners before, again, unions and government collaborated in order to force everybody to do the same thing. So no, uh, uh, capitalism is what produced the short work day. Capitalism is what produced uh, children in schools and not working in the factories. Nobody, if you, if you talk to any businessman, nobody wants to manage five-year-olds at the machines. Um, no parent wants to send their kids to the factory. The reason they sent their kids to the factory in the late 19th century, because if they didn't send them to the factory, they would starve. But when the parents made enough money to be able to feed their own kids, they sent them to school. So you're saying that without child labor laws, the capitalism would have just naturally removed kids from the workforce? Un, 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 absolutely. And you see it in every single country. There's a great book by uh, an economist by the name of Ben Powell about sweatshops. And he shows that in every single country, developing country, you see the same phenomena. You see as productivity and wages go up, child labor goes down. When, product, when, when it, child labor reaches a certain percentage of the workforce, very low percentage, government steps in and passes a law against it. But it declines because parents are making more money and sending and taking their kids out of the factory and sending them to school. I'm in not every single country, it's the same thing. And it's it's well documented empirically. But again, but, but then again, how do, yeah. but then again, every single advanced country on the planet has laws against trial. No, no, yes, because because it's popular laws. If I'm in the government and I want to get votes, of then course. once I'm not, once child labor is no longer a real problem, I pass child labor laws and everybody thinks I'm a hero. Uh, you, can, you can go and you can see it in Indonesia and in Malaysia and you can see the same thing pattern happening. Child, child uh, labor goes down, then the law is passed, not the other way around. Yeah, I guess where you and I differ is uh, I, I'm not as confident, nearly as confident as you are that uh, pure capitalism will take care of all these problems. Uh, but that's you, you seem to be pretty confident in the fact that pure capitalism, if left alone, can basically solve every problem, right? Yes, I think I think if the government is With limited, the exception to of murder and theft. Yeah, I mean that's where the government, if the government is limited to to protecting us from a physical force and and fraud, then um, the rest capitalism not only will solve all the problems, but it will provide us with a kind of standard of living and quality of life that I think most of us cannot even imagine. Yeah, I, I have my serious doubts about that, but I guess it's kind of hard to say since it's never really been done. I mean, the well, every time it's been done, the success is is just unbelievable. It's just hard to it's hard to grasp how good it made human life relative to the alternative. And we, can are, see, we can see that over and over and over again. But what are modern examples of it being done? Well, Hong Kong was a modern example. There's un, I, it's, I don't know if you ever went to Hong Kong, but it was a pretty unbelievable. No, I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard good things about Hong Kong. But there, was Hong no, Kong there was no no welfare, no no uh, no uh, uh, regular, very little regulation. But there, were, there was universal health care in Hong Kong. No, there wasn't universal health care. I believe so. Or I might be thinking of Taiwan, but one of those. They had you, Taiwan. And, 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 and the system, and, you know, they might be today. But there certainly wasn't 20, 30 years ago when Hong Kong was was on. What, what what is the period of Hong Kong that you have in mind that you're describing? Post World War II. Okay, so you're talking about like what 1950s, 1960s. It started in it started in the yeah it started right after World War II. So. And when when did it end? Like when did it? I mean, end? I, I don't. I think it ended you know two years ago. The the, the real growth now specific laws have changed over time, so the government has gotten involved more. But um, yeah, so I mean, they definitely right now have a universal uh, healthcare type of system, similar to England, basically, is their healthcare system, which again, I'm not even the biggest fan of. I'm just saying. But so okay, look, just yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, let's, I guess we, the whole point, <laughs> we kind of went on a massive side tangent, but I think it was interesting. Uh, do you have another 15 minutes or you got a balance? Sure, sure, we can do 15 minutes. Okay, so let me, let me start on this asking you, uh, what is your position on casual sex? Um, I think it's fine. Um, I think it's, uh, it can be fun. Uh, I, I think, uh, I don't think it can be the, I don't think it's the most fulfilling sex. I don't think it's the most interesting sex. I don't think it's the most rewarding sex. Uh, and I don't think it is a basis for kind of living, uh, over the long run. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't even necessarily disagree with that. Uh, honestly, I don't know if we're going to disagree with much. The only thing I, okay, I, I took this, you had a podcast. It was like the one we were discussing the me too thing. Yeah. Uh, and you were discussing women using sex as a way of advancing their career or making money. And you were saying in like the 21st century that we should be above that basically. Is that correct? Or yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, I would argue that we are definitely not above that. Uh, I would say it's probably more rampant now than it's ever been. Uh, you know, with OnlyFans and whatnot. And you have this phenomenon of women quitting their day jobs to do OnlyFans. And I can't even necessarily fault them uh, because they can, because they can, like a chick who's working, you know, 40 hours a week has to go to the office. She makes 4,000. She quits her job, works from home, shows her feet on OnlyFans, and she makes 40,000. So I would say that it's getting worse instead of getting better. So, so what I was talking about there is, uh, is women who are career women who are, uh, you know, in business, in tech, in, I don't know, in the movies or whatever. And in the past, uh, there was the expectation they would sleep their way to the top. Um, and hopefully that's gone away. That is that they're valued for their ability, they're valued for their mind, they're valued for their ability to manage and things like that. Now, are there more opportunities to use sex uh, in order to make a living? Yes. So OnlyFans is a good example of that. But I think that is that is a consequence of the, uh, shallowness and the uh, and the fact that we live in a society that has degraded sex and has degraded life generally. I think people are living suboptimal lives broadly, so that too many men uh, need to get you know to get uh, gratification uh, online rather than gratification in person, uh, and therefore are, uh, are using platforms like Oni uh, OnlyFans and paying for it. Uh, hopefully. Uh, if we were more enlightened and and uh, and, and took our, our lives more seriously, I, I think that uh, there would be fewer opportunities, not more opportunities, for women to use their bodies uh, purely, their bodies, in order to make a living. I would just say that's a humongous if. That is, it is a, a humongous hum if. That is a humongous but I, if. But I think I think we live in a very, I, I think we're very rich uh, materially and very poor spiritually. And I'm an atheist, so when I say spiritually, I mean. Uh, a function of consciousness, a function of the kind of the, the what the kind of life we can live that is outside of the material realm. I think we're very poor spiritually. I think our education about sex, about art, about aesthetic experience, about what is possible in human life, it, is pretty lame and pretty weak. And I think if we had a, uh, a more a, a better educated, more uh, grown up, uh, more for for men, more manly population. Then uh, you know they they would be they would be consuming less of this uh, gratuitous nonsense online. Sure, I, I agree with that. But would you agree that the issue is just getting worse? Yeah, I think it is getting worse. I think spiritually we're in, de we're in decline. I think culturally we're in decline. I, I think, by the way, a mixed economy. I don't think those are uh, unrelated. I think mm -hmm. a mixed economy encourages uh, cultural decline, but that's a whole other topic. So, uh, so I think I think we are. I think. Uh, um, we have less and less of an appreciation for the kind of values that make a good life. And again, this is where Ayn Rand comes in. I think Ayn Rand provides you with a personal philosophy to help you to help you create a, a fantastic life uh, focused on real values and not focused on shallow, degrading um, activities. Yeah, I think I think then we don't even necessarily disagree with anything when it comes to uh, to sex. I think we're pretty much in agreement there. I think the only thing we disagree about is something completely unrelated, which is the uh, how capitalism, like how successful capitalism is when left alone. Uh, but I think we kind of had a good discussion on that. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, I think this was a good discussion. Uh, is there anything? Do you have any closing thoughts or anything you want to mention? No, I mean, I, we, we, I think we agree on sex. I mean, I think, I think the ultimate in sex is when you love somebody and, and, uh, and you can have a, an extended relationship with them yeah, and I would agree, yeah. because you learn more about what 
what is better for them and for you sexually. And you also have the spiritual element on top of the physical element. And I think that is that is the ultimate when it comes to sex. And that's what we, I, you know, we're looking for. I think when you're young, that's what you're looking for, hopefully, is that kind of relationship and a world in which we have more of those kind of relationships is a better world. So aside from Ayn Rand, what are some other like authors on your reading list? Like what are some other books you would recommend? Well, I mean, from an economics perspective, I think the greatest economist who ever lived is a guy named Ludwig von Mises. Uh, and generally what I will call the Austrian school of economics, which is a very pro-capitalist free market school of economics. You know, I also liked uh, Milton Friedman and, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of Chicago uh, economist, also free market economist. Um, other books, I, I, you know, I like, I like some of the work of Steven Pinker. I disagree with him on a lot of stuff, but I think his kind of a, a optimistic view of, of, uh, of where we're heading, his emphasis on reason and rationality. Again, we disagree on certain aspects of that, but generally I think, I think that is a, um, is a positive uh, view. I'm, I'm currently reading um, The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch. Uh, there's a ton I disagree in this book with, but there's also a lot of really interesting aspects to it, and particularly his optimism about technology, about the future, about man's ability to conquer nature, which I think is what life is partially about, and our ability to thrive as human beings. That is a positive view of humanity moving into the future. Sometimes you need kind of an optimistic jolt. It's very easy to become uh, cynical in this world. Yeah, that, well, that's an issue in of itself. Um, all right, so where can guys go to support you and find your uh, find your content? Uh, I mean, YouTube, just put my name on YouTube and you'll find my content. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, uh, you can also uh, go to my website, youronbookshow.com. Uh, and of course, if you want to find out about Ayn Rand, and I hope some of you guys will, uh, read Atlas Shrugged, read The Fountainhead, and you can go to aynrand.org, A-Y-N-R-A-N-D.org. Cool, cool. Yeah, I'll have to check out your debate with uh, Ben Shapiro, or I guess he said it was more of a discussion, so I'll have to check well, it out. Well, it was his show. He kind of interviewed me, so I, I think you'll enjoy it, yeah. Cool, I'll check it out. All right, awesome. Thank so, you, Jan. I appreciate you. it. This was fun. Right. Take care, guys. Bye.